Welcome to my review of season one of the Obi-Wan Kenobi Disney Plus series. Now, going into this series, I was very trepidatious because I had known they were going to do a Vader Obi-Wan fight. And being somebody who's been a fan of Star Wars since I was four, obviously, even before the prequels came out, I knew that they had a battle on a volcanic planet. And that's how Anakin got his body charred up to become Darth Vader. Right, That is something that's been talked about even before Revenge of the Sith came out. And I like the idea of the final battle that Obi-Wan and Anakin have before they meet again in the first Star Wars film from 1977, A New Hope, was on Mustafar. But this show changes that. And so I'm going to tell you kind of my overall season one thoughts and uh, the good and the bad. So the good is... First of all, we have to give a big standing ovation to Ewan McGregor. What a tremendous actor. This guy did the best he could with the material he was given. He conveyed emotion through his eyes. He really tried his best to channel Alec Guinness, an older, wiser Obi-Wan. And I love how in the early episodes, he's getting reacquainted with the Force because he hasn't been in the battle in a long time. And he's not even sure if he can do it. He's a general, uh, a former general who's been at war, but it's been so long he doesn't know. The way they kind of dragged him into the story, I did feel a bit shoehorned. It definitely felt like, like we never knew that Obi-Wan and Bail Organa were still in communication. Now, with that being said, throughout the entirety of the show, he was tremendous. He was a great, great, great performer. And I got to say, too, that, you know, Ewan McGregor uh, was really the highlight of the show. Now, on the other side, we have... Hayden Christensen, who had a few scenes here and there, but to me, the real Vader MVP was probably hearing James Earl Jones again, because for some reason in Rogue One, he didn't sound great. He sounded like he was sick. And I don't know if in this show they did better voice modulation, but this Vader sounded like the Vader of old, and he was determined to finally get his hands on Obi-Wan again. And I loved Obi-Wan's reaction to finding out what happened to Anakin's body, and just everything and that PTSD he's got coming back to him. Now, the Leia character, I, I'm a little bit mixed on this because one of the things that I don't like about TV shows, especially ones that are like American TV shows when, and movies, whenever they write children in these things, they always make them know-it-all smart asses. They always make them, you know... Uh, they, you know, they, they have this weird intuition. It's, it's a recurring theme we see over and over again. Uh, and in this show, Leia did have that. However, in speaking to somebody during the show's airing that actually met Carrie Fisher and hung out with her, this was apparently a trait that Carrie Fisher, the actual woman, had. Carrie Fisher was the kind of person who can look you in the eyes and read your soul and tell what's wrong, what kind of person you are. It was almost like the real woman had the force in a way. It was just really good intuition. And they played that up here, but she kind of was threading on that, you know, getting annoying kind of thing. Now, Moses Ingram playing the uh, the third sister, Reva, who wound up being kind of... She kind of wound up being the lead villain, even though the real lead villain was Vader. And a lot of folks had a problem with her getting so much screen time on a show that was meant to be about the downfall of Anakin and Obi-Wan, and not the downfall, that's the wrong word, but the disintegration of their friendship from 10 years ago and their first time seeing each other. She really took up a lot of screen time, and Moses Ingram, I don't think, deserved all of the racial nonsense that she got just for playing a role and doing her job. But the problem with the character, right, not with Moses, with the character, well, really, some of it was Moses in that her performance to me... She didn't feel legitimate. She didn't feel like she didn't feel like a threat at any point. Especially in episode 5 when Vader pretty much manhandled her. Like she was nothing and I knew that against Obi-Wan she would end up ultimately getting chewed up if that ever happened, but she got a redemption arc and they're probably going to keep going with that character. This show was probably now done to introduce that character so they can do more with her, but if I'm being brutally honest with you, 
I do not care about that character. I genuinely don't. I care about Obi-Wan, Anakin. I even care about Luke and Leia, obviously, even as kids, and Bail Organa. I do not care about the Inquisitors that much. The Inquisitors are basically jobbers to the stars. They are there to flaunt Sith stuff, but they're not actual full-blown Sith. They're dark side users, but not that strong. Not on the level of a true Sith like a Palpatine or a Vader. So, I like the fact they were used here, and they were used intelligently and for the right purposes, but ultimately, Inquisitors will never really be taken seriously as a threat. The lightsaber duel in Episode 6 was, in my opinion, or Part 6, was the best lightsaber duel of the Disney era. From when Disney purchased it, it was the best one. Not quite on the level of some of the legendary ones like Revenge of the Sith, or even Luke vs. Vader on the Death Star, or even the Phantom Menace, you know, Duel of the Fates. I, I don't think it was on that level. I would say maybe the only thing that comes close would probably be the fight between Darth Maul and Ahsoka Tano in the Season 7 finale or whatever, or the final episodes of Clone Wars. That was good stuff. This, to me, was great. Seeing Obi-Wan using his powers to the max again was great, and seeing Vader get humbled and realize he's still very much a student, you know, to me, was good stuff. Although, at the same time, and this, to me, was my main issue watching this show. Because it, it, it's very difficult for me to explain this. But if you're a Star Wars fan, try to follow me here. And I talked about this on a previous review. My issue is that the show feels extremely manufactured, extremely corporate. You've got the minority character who... And again, she doesn't deserve her harassment. And I'm a minority too. But you've got the character who was kind of put in there to... You know, show diversity because you've also got an Asian Inquisitor. Like, you know, that's fine. I'm not mad about that, but her character did not get over with me. And then you've got sort of, there wasn't that much woke stuff here. Like, I think people were afraid of, but uh, I think the issue, the underwhelming issue is that this feels unnecessary. And throughout the entire time watching it, from episode one all the way through, it really felt like it didn't need to exist. It felt like it was done. And and again, kudos to James Earl Jones and Ewan McGregor. This is not about the people who worked on the show. It's about Disney. This felt like they just wanted to make a show about Obi-Wan and have Obi-Wan and Vader fighting again. That's the way this felt. It didn't feel necessary. There's already been tons of stories that take place in between episodes three and four, including Rebels and, you know, the Bad Batch and other stuff like that. We've gotten Rogue One. There's tons of stuff. Han Solo show or Han Solo movie, I'm sorry, uh, the Solo film. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. So it's not like this era has not been explored, but... As I'm watching it, I'm trying to get into it. I'm trying to really, you know, give it its fair shot. But in the back of my mind, creeping in the back of my mind, it just kept coming off like, okay, this is manufactured bullshit. They're trying to show us Alderaan. Leia as a baby and Luke as a baby was forced. I was kind of hoping for more of a Obi-Wan adventure where he's just on Tatooine dealing with the huts and bounty hunters. Something more like that is what I was hoping for. But the way that the story had kind of developed from him leaving Tatooine to go rescue Leia to him fighting Vader twice, really, it just really felt like this was done for those purposes. And that's been the problem with Disney Star Wars. Too many member berries, too much of a focus on nostalgia pops, which... I think can work to a degree, but I also think that Disney has squeezed this freaking lemon as much as it can go, and there's no more juice left, or at least not much. It's very difficult for a Star Wars fan like me, and I know some of you guys are like this too, to actually accept this story as being canon, not because it was a bad story, that's not really why, but because we know that these characters, like these, you know... Luke, Leia, Obi-Wan, Vader, very important characters to Star Wars. And I don't think Disney should be messing with these characters anymore. They already did with Palpatine, the sequel trilogy, and with Luke. And that led to disastrous circumstances and the fandom pretty much flipping on them. I think that, or I feel like the future of Disney Star Wars should be on new characters 
The Mandalorian, maybe Ahsoka, because, you know, Dave Filoni's around for that. But, like, The Mandalorian, um, like, something in the new, the, the, the High Republic, something in the far past or the far future. I would stay away from this era because you're just going to get fans that are going to criticize you over basically making money off of George Lucas's creations, which they bought fair and square for $4 billion. I'm not an idiot when it comes to that. But... When you start adding extra stories with current characters, it's difficult, especially when it comes to what they did here, for people to accept it. And based on everything Disney has done previously, including the sequel trilogy, which was a complete dumpster fire, you know, Kenobi was much better than that, but I can't help shake the feeling that it just... It's missing something. It's it's missing... I can't quite put my finger on it but it's missing an element that the old movies had and it just feels like hey look it's Hayden when he was younger hey look Obi-Wan and Vader it's almost like they're like we're all little kids and they're trying to distract us with these cool visuals and fights and to tell this story that did not need to be told ultimately this story does not need to be told and yes it does mess with the canon whether you want to accept it or not it does they tried to make it fit i'll give them credit for that but it changes things it recontextualizes things leia now knows ben okay she's heard of ben in episode four but she never met him but now she did meet him it's changed now the line that vader and obi-wan have in that movie referencing their previous battle is no longer about mustafar it's about this there's just one thing after another bail organa seeing obi-wan I had thought they didn't even see each other since the Clone Wars. There's a lot of things that they went in there and they added to the canon and changed things. Now, again, there was good, too. I mentioned the lightsaber duel with Vader and Obi-Wan. That was, that was legit good stuff and creative stuff. But there, I couldn't shake that feeling. And I think some newer fans might not care, but... And again, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me, even though I've seen comments that agree with me. It just didn't, it felt very manufactured, did not really feel authentic. This show did not need to be made. I don't know if anybody was actually clamoring for another Obi-Wan and Vader confrontation. I don't know. I, I was happy with how they executed it. I thought it was much better than expected. The Moses Ingram character did come off really annoying, even though her backstory is interesting. It wasn't that interesting, and I would hope that for the next season of Obi-Wan, she's not in it at all, even though she probably will be. So, again, a lot of this is just based on instincts and feelings and stuff like that. Objectively, the show was done really well. There were some holes and certain things that didn't make a lot of sense, like when it comes to power scaling Vader and Obi-Wan. Um, but I didn't mind that too much because I could have it make sense in my own head. You know what I mean? Especially like when Anakin's talking to Obi-Wan and it's back to being Hayden's voice. That didn't really match up what they did with Hayden. I'm sorry, with a Vader versus Ahsoka, which was very similar. You know, it's been done before, but not everyone has seen that show. Not every Star Wars fan has seen that. And the cameos that we saw of both Palpatine and, um... Qui-Gon Jinn at the end of episode 6 really felt like fan service. It's just something where it's the same old Disney fan service crap, but at the very least, we got a good lightsaber duel that was the best one of the Disney era, and we got Ewan McGregor acting his ass off. So to be honest, those are the wins, and I also laid out the losses. Very conflicted on this one. Um, I liked what I saw, but I'm probably not going to ever watch it again. The Mandalorian is a show I can watch multiple times. There's something about that show that's very charming, but this show, outside of like watching the Vader sequences, because I love Vader so much, I'm probably not going to revisit it anytime soon. Not because it's bad, but because, like I said, it, it just felt like it wasn't needed, and ultimately, I couldn't shake that feeling. I did the best I could. I'm only human. It is what it is. It is what it is. So it was one of the better Disney shows in the Star Wars Disney, I guess, you know, synergy. And there were things to like about it, but it's just not one that I'm totally going crazy over.
but I got to give it up because the highs were really high and the lows were somewhat forgettable, but still kind of creeping in the background. So that's my thoughts on season one of Obi-Wan. I'm going to do a video previewing what I think is going to happen with season two. So expect that video soon. Thanks again. Have a great day. See you soon.